The tone, follow the pound sign. Conference. Hey, you can begin, Steve. Well, I'm Steve Flegel. I'm with the National Weather Service Office in Marquette, Michigan, and I'm going to talk about some of our aviation and external aviation grids that we do here at our office. There it goes. Uh, so we started in the, the external fire weather grid which featured some of the ceiling and visibility grids back in February of 2002. And uh, something that we just kind of set up to kind of see how things were and how they worked. And, and after we kind of saw how, how things were doing, we, we started to expand on it a little more. Um, but those initial tools that we got uh, for, for some of the ceiling and visibility grids, uh, we kind of they took more of a consensus approach on and just kind of averaging out like the NAM or the GFS or, or that type of thing. And so um, we kind of expanded out to take a look at a lot more models across the area, and um, both with what we derived from um, model RH or, you know, straight model uh, visibilities or cloud cover or ceiling heights. Um, and this was completely off to the forecasters, and we just kind of had it run in the background just to see how things were doing before we really started to kind of to promote it. But one of the things that we found out as we were, we, you know, creating them in the background is, you know, it ended up having a pretty good handle on, you know, getting a rough idea of when, you know, ceilings would fall or rise or, or thing with the visibilities. And, you know, it's with the timing factor. Maybe it wasn't perfect on, on the, you know, the actual visibility values or the ceiling values, but, you know, it kind of had that idea of, okay, you know, the the vest would fall in you know this couple hour period or so, and then just as another overview, uh, we originally started creating it every sixty or through sixty hours and every three hours between there, and we just kind of interpolated through. But as we uh, kind of looked a little more closely and expanded things out, uh, we've extended out to seven through the two hours, and then. Uh, the first two hours now are, are run hourly using some hour model and then also interpolation. And we do every three hours after that through 72 hours and then kind of interpolate in between them. So in our, our graphical forecast editor, or the, the G which we use here at the Weather Service, uh, we add in ceiling and visibility grids to our forecast database. Uh, like I mentioned, the ceiling stuff was calculated off of model RH and essentially arrived on the fly. So it, it kind of took a toll on on the computers with the processing on the fly. Uh, so back uh, this past March, at the beginning of March, we ended up changing it to more of a background processing. Uh, so they you know, it kind of provided a couple of options. One, so the forecasters could look at each individual model and see what you know, ceiling visibility data is, is being shown. And two, we also adjusted the, the way the calculations were to, instead of just being straight, RA did with RH with respect to ice. Um, and then we also converted over some of the visibility grids at that time, too. Um, and that kind of conversion, we enhanced some of the consensus stuff, the, the calculations in the first 12 hours that I mentioned, um, both using the hourly model data, like the HRR or RAP, um, and then also kind of interpolated some of the three or six hour model data, like the MAP and the MET or, or GFS NAM, that type of stuff, to get like an hourly model data from them and then incorporate that into the hourly calculations. And the other thing we did is we added the ability to do some weighting. So that way, if we were seeing some models performing better, uh, we could add you know, weights to them to, to kind of improve the overall forecast. Uh, list of the models included, and I'm not going to kind of go through them, but it gives you kind of a general idea of, of what we do for, you know, both the ceiling and the visibility. And uh, we kind of use it, you know, as you can see, it's mainly, uh, you know, American um, models. And then we also add in some of our local uh, wharf runs that we do here at the office. And then, unfortunately, due to both GFE and AWS limitations, we don't or aren't using any of the the, the 
Ben model or the ECMWF and uh, some of the other NCEPT models just be due to the lack of, uh, of you know, real data that we get in. And the forecasters can can do the data within the, our GFE. Uh, we have a separate subset of aviation um, viewing, so we can look at both uh, the kind of the consensus ceiling and visibility data, and then also you know, all the individual models. So it makes it real easy to kind of go through and you know it, whether or not it's seeing how things are performing in the current time frame or what they're expecting in the in the future. Uh, and and we also set up a, a color table to to match our categorical uh, amendment criteria. Uh, Batch. Fortunately for us, for all, all three of our task sites are, are the same, so it made it real easy to um, to you know have the color table the same for the whole and or for the entire area and um, just kind of a normal um, kind of coloring curve down to where you know kind of red or purple ends up being you know the worst conditions and then transitions up to to gray or, or black to to show the the improving conditions. I also added the information into Avian FPS, kind of similar to what some of the Eastern Region offices in, in the Weather Service have done uh, to add in the, both the visibility and the ceiling data. And that made it real easy for the forecasters to be able to see uh, the information kind of in a you know in a place where they would be looking for the, you know the GFS data, or the the NAM MOS, and that. So it made it real easy to also be able to see some of the timing features there where. You know where the, the gridded information is showing. You know the reduced abilities or the lower ceiling values. Um, and you know while we had to make some, a few more background changes, but we might uh, kind of go with more of a consistency with what some of the other offices are have been starting to do or have been doing. I'll uh, so show a couple case studies of, of how the grids have worked out or haven't worked out over the last uh, couple months. Uh, the first one is from March 2011, or March 11, 2013. Um, we had a low pressure system moving out of the plains and through the Great Lakes region. And, uh, the image here on the on the left hand side is our snowfall forecast uh, that period. So, pretty good swath of snow across the central part of Upper Michigan, and, and influencing one of our task sites, um, Sawyer National Airport, or KSAW, which is located roughly around where the pointer is there. And you know, kind of one of our, or pretty much the main airport in in the UP for for traffic for us. So, um, so this is a good case study to kind of show how how the system impacted that site. Here's some examples. Of, uh, unfortunately, the limitations on with some you know loops and animations just kind of added a couple of kind of like snapshots of of, of how ceiling and visibility grids look through this event. So this is as the low pressure system is starting to move through Illinois and approach the area. So the visibility grids are kind of highlighting the area where, you know, some of that um, your snow was falling and then um, you also have that with the ceiling grids. And so I'm just going to kind of step through uh, six hours at a time here. So you can see here six hours later, it, it, you know, that low pressure system starting to move into into Lake Vian. You can see a pretty wide swath of of moderate to heavy snow across the area, and and anywhere you're kind of seeing some of those oranges and reds, it's you know, generally like a mile and a half or lower, or a mile or lower in the visibilities. And then step another six hours, and it's kind of transitioning as that you know the main swath of precipitation is moving out with the northeast winds across Lake Superior. It's kind of transitioning more to a a lake effect or lake enhanced event where you start to see the the higher Visibility or lower visibility values over the higher terrain of, of north central or Michigan, which is kind of one of the, the you know traditional things that we see up here in the, with those type of uh, low pressure system tracks. Brief bounce out to, to verification. Um, these are critical amendment criteria categories. I'm not going to go into the you know the real nitty gritty for them, but the main thing is just kind of the highlight the color coding that I've got here because I kind of use it throughout the rest of the slides. Uh, and this is just kind of highlighting our MVFR, must file alter alternates, IFR, and then the alternate landing mins and the airfield landing mins. So um, just kind of keep those color schemes you know, in mind as we kind of go through some of these next couple slides. But the main one we would kind of be highlighting is more in the, uh, you know, the yellow, uh, red, and 
purple colors. To look at the verification for this event for the for the International Airport um, there in Kett County, uh, the 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 car, the first grouping here on the left hand side, that was uh, uh, really like a 24-hour forecast, or that you know, was grids that were created for the for the March 10th at 6Z TAF forecast. And we've kind of run every um, couple of times before each TAF forecast will, so we end up running it right around eight times per day. Uh, so that way we can kind of get a, a initial guess there for the forecasters um, a couple hours out and then run it right again right before the, the TAFs go out to get kind of the most recent model data. But the thing to highlight in, in this first column is we've, and this is the same all the way through, is we've got the actual METAR observations from Sawyer, um, identified METAR, here's the ceiling, and then the visibility here. And anything that I've got labeled NDFD, that's essentially our, our local grids here. So uh, the, the key thing to highlight here, 24 hours out, is, you know, they, especially visibility, they had the idea of that alternate landing mins, um, you know, pretty consistently, you know, once we got, you know, all of that 24-hour period. It wasn't you know, exactly perfect on the timing. Looks like, you know, in this case, the METARs reported the, those visibilities lower um, than what the forecast was indicating 24 hours out. But as we start bouncing, you know, go to 12-hour out forecast, you can see that, that that kind of difference or the timing is getting a lot better there between the, the you know, the actual METARs and the gridded database. And then when we go to six hours out, you know, it pretty much nailed it, you know, right on the nose for, for that hourly start time. Um, looking at some of the ceiling data, you can kind of see here, uh, like it's mainly indicating that alternate landing, or it must file alternate um, in our grids, but, uh, you know, it was more of an IFR alternate landing mins for, for the, the METAR, and that's kind of one of the biases that we've seen, and I'll kind of go into that a little bit further, where you can have a little bit of a high bias in the ceiling grids. The case um, from this past March on March 19th, we had a low-pressure system that, that was, was shifting east out of the northern plains and through the Great Lakes region. Uh, and kind of this ends up being for our, our, one of our other TAF sites, Houghton County Airport, uh, KTMX, which is located on the Keweenaw Peninsula. And that one's, uh, you know, majority of the time through the winter kind of controlled by lake effect clouds and precipitation. Uh, but one of the key things with this one was just the the fact that at, at you know essentially 24 to 30 hours out, so you know beyond the, the time period, it, it pretty much nailed the visibilities going down to your, your alternate landing minimums, and even had some hints at the airfield landing minimums too. So just having that that information in there is just kind of a you know a, a, a success situation here where you know even though it may not have been in the task, it's a real easy to say you know to look at that and be like hey. You know, maybe put that in the mention aviation discussion, or you know, be able to that had information out there to let people know that it's that it's coming up. And then once again, in this case, you know, the the ceiling values ended up being a lot, lot, lot lower than what the um, from METAR than what our grids had. And another case, um, this is a shell moisture case from March of this year too. Um, we had lake effect clouds. Uh, and snow showers that had diminished, and with the high pressure moving over the area, we had kind of those, that low level moisture trapped over the lake. And with light winds under the high pressure, it was kind of at the mercy of where the wind directions were going. Uh, so, a little to see here, but the clouds are kind of, you know, right as they're here. And this one is going to be for Sawyer again uh, there in, in Marquette County. It was kind of a, a tough case because the models were really. You know, differing on on what was happening. So uh, on the far left hand side, I've got the wrap, and you can see the wrap is really picking up on that level moisture. Had a real good handle on it. Um, just in its initial conditions, it's kind of hinting at it, but you know, not so much. And the NAM didn't have it at all. So um, unfortunately, with the way the the aviation grids go, um, they have pretty heavy reliance on on models are showing. And you know, if the models aren't showing it, or, or there's some differences in the models. Uh, it can really start to str tar struggle. So this was a case where it struggled. Uh, you can see this is the actual um, 
grid that, or the initial condition grid that had uh, from the models um, for radiation grids, and kind of hinted at some MVFR ceilings out over the eastern part of the UP um, and over Lake Superior, but over as a whole, it was saying MVFR conditions across the area, and um, so kind of definitely was a, a case where it really struggled. And, and you know, I think a lot of that comes down to with the models kind of differing on on how much moisture was there in the initial conditions. Um, looking at our taps too, and in our discussions, we were kind of struggling on it too on how quickly the winds were going to switch from more of a northeasterly direction where it would push those low clouds into the Sawyer, um, and kind of switch to more of an offshore direction and push it out. So the taps had the the right idea, but you know, they too struggled on on how quickly that would move out. It it lingered a lot longer than what than what we were expecting. Also, uh, so back in at the beginning of February, we after running this for pretty much a year. We decided you know we need to start looking at verification and and getting a better idea of where it's performing well and where it's not. We kind of had some general ideas, but uh, we wanted you know some some t statistics to kind of to verify what we were what we were looking and, and confirm our, our thoughts. Uh, so we do have a couple caveats before I show some of the verification data. Um, the local verification of our grids, um, unfortunately not I, completely clinical the way our NWS verification goes. Uh, we only looked at the hourly OBS at the top of the hour, and then we also just looked at ceiling height uh, with no restriction by cloud cover, like you know, the normal TAF verification is done is only looking you know, at green um, overcast vertical visibility type stuff. So we just looked at ceiling height as a whole. And we also left out one of our sites, Ironwood, Michigan, uh, because it, it's been much hit or miss on observations. And so we, you know, just to simplify it and and we did kind of filter through when it came in and when it didn't, we just kind of let out. And then what the NWS verification too is it has, uh, it does find it a calculation that has the specials, which we didn't include in the NDFD verification. So they're slightly different, but I think as a whole, it can kind of give us a, a general idea. So these, I guess, four slides that we'll have is just kind of looking at the verification both on the zero to six hour period in the TAP and then the six to 24 hour outlook time uh, time period in the TAP. And all of these are from using all of February and all of March. Uh, and then color scheme is the same on them. The, the blue here on the left-hand side uh, the tan bar is our aviation grids, or labeled as NDFD. The red is our TAFs. Uh, green is GFS MOS, and then NAM MOS, and then GFS LAMP as you go through. So a big thing that kind of sticks out in this case with ceilings and in the first hit column is is, is our forecast, which you know is what we would hope would be the case is is kind of beating out everything else in those first six. So especially up here, the kind of the most important uh, time since our you know. Our uh, aviation needs are more in kind of those first couple of hours or um, kind of time period. Um, and then kind of the big thing, too, with our office and the ceilings is, is we're not missing on more than, you know, two categories or more off. Um, we're doing a lot better than all the other model guidance in that case. But we're at visibility. Um, that's where we start to see some skill um, in our aviation grids. We, you know, our visibility ends up matching or a little bit better than what our TAF is doing in the first six hours. And then, you know, pretty much the same way across the board with, you know, being one category off or being two or more categories off. So definitely showing skill over, um, you know, the straight MOS guidance up here. Jumping over to, for Houghton, for the same first six hours, uh, once again, kind of seeing that similar idea where, uh, you know, office TAFs are doing better than, than the rest of the guidance through ceiling values and you know especially in this case with um, time where the you know the ceiling were two or more categories off we uh, our tests were a lot better and that was one of the struggles with um, our NDFD grids or aviation grids where um, it was you know struggling with that and I think some of that's been improved or only been improved with our move to RH with respect to ice here in the last uh, couple months um, but the ability, you know once again it's as good, or, you know, maybe you know, maybe a little bit better in some cases than everything else. Uh, especially, you know, our tests are kind of similar. Um, we start seeing things even out as when we move more towards that outlook period or the six to twenty-four hour time 
forecast. Um, you know, looking at at ceiling, you know, pretty similar across the board with all the guidance. So, you know, not you know a significant improvement. The one thing you know in this case is is office ends up doing better with um, you know, being uh, you know seeing within one category. Um, you know, so we're you know we're, we've the right idea, but we're, you know we're not you know extremely off. Uh, which is, you know, we're seeing, you know, kind of where the rest of the guidances can be, um, you know, two or more categories off a little more often than our our tasks. But, you know, once again, in, the, in this case, the visibility grids, you know, really starting to show us some skill where, you know, definitely seeing a lot better than what, you know, the rest of the, you know, minds or our tasks are doing um, you know, the rest of the way. And that same same thing holds true for Houghton where, um, you know, the visibility continues to show skill. And that's kind of something that we had seen um, over the first year and, you know, that kind of solidifies, you know, the fact that the ceilings in are, have been doing, um, forming pretty well and doing better than what than what most of their uh, guidance is saying. So um, some of the positives that we've seen in grids is does really well with synoptic systems, uh, especially, you know, or as long as there's the model consistency there. If there isn't the model consistency, that's when you can see it start getting shaky and, you know, it's kind of the same thing with, with some, you know, our forecast. And um, as I've been mentioning, the visibility is both with, uh, you know, actual values and the timing um, really been doing well. And I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, a lot coming from derived data from the models and straight from the models instead of try, trying to calculate it out like we do with the ceiling. Uh, we did do some changes here with that respect to ice to to improve the ceilings and lake effect areas, and that especially helped for for Houghton when we made that change. The shortcomings that we with the, the sh with the deviation grids, um, one of them I already showed that shallow moist layer. Um, you know, models kind of struggle with that as I showed in that case, and then we also have kind of some limitations within GFE where we only get data into GFE every 25 millibars. So, you know, it's there's a pretty potential, there it could be a potential that those those shallow layers end up getting missed by, you know, by those, those values. Um, uh, we also kind of struggle with this timing of the lake effect snow and clouds. It always seems like we kind of ended earlier than what it is, and, you know, part may be biased by the way the models kind of handle that. And then the big thing for us, is, is trying to get a handle on um, on the low ceilings, and, and I think a lot of it, you know, based off of what I've looked at, kind of the, is due to the way we kind of average everything out. Um, because if a lot of times they'll be at those lower ceilings, but if you get like one or two models that you know maybe don't have that low ceiling, um, it can just you know up the you know the visibility or the ceiling values pretty quickly. Um, you know, an example if we had you know, let's say models, and when we're showing 500 foot, but you get one that's 20,000 feet, it's gonna it's gonna shoot up the consensus ceiling up to almost 2,500 feet. So, you know, that's a pretty significant change or jump in the in the values, and you know, kind of in one of the more critical times. Another thing too is, you know, with um, the heavier snow, or especially up here in the winter time, the blowing snow, um, a lot of times you get some vertical visibilities that you know, won't be by the ceiling grids because you're calculating more of the ceiling and not based off of what's happening at the surface. So I think that's something that we can um, maybe improve based off of our actual forecast for for those sites by, you know, like using some tools to adjust the, the ceilings based off of the, you know, if we have snow or, you know, moderate blowing snow or, or you know, moderate blowing snow. And then just kind of continue to highlight that, that issue that we have with the lack of lower ceilings, um, just take a look at the frequency of, you know, how often METAR values show a certain, um, you know, category, and then how often our aviation grids show a category. So we've got um, from left to right VFR, MVFR, and then the MUFA alternate IFR, alternate landing mins, and airport landing mins. And so, you know, the big thing that sticks out is in that VFR range where um, the METARs, you know, in this case for Sawyer and, and the first 36 hours, um, of the forecast would show you know, about 40% of the time or a little over 40% of the time VFR conditions where our ceiling grids would show a little over 60%. So I think that's kind of the big, the big is kind of narrowing down and getting into these, these lower ceilings because you can see, you know, IR and below, you know, me 
meters, you know, show that, you know, the frequency flow, you know, overall percentage isn't much, but, I mean, there's a huge discrepancy between what we're actually getting with um, than what's actually being reported. Uh, but if you shift over to visibility, you know, like I was showing in some of the previous uh, verification, you know, the visibility is it's got a handle on how things would go throughout, you know, pretty good, um, you know, comparison between them. So I think the visibility is, is sitting pretty good. It's, you know, the ceiling that we need to work on a little bit. Some of that improvement, you know, like I alluded to earlier, mentioned before, is with the Irish with respect to ice. Make that change, you know, really seemed to show a, a significant improvement in the low ceilings, uh, especially at our uh, Houghton's uh, KCMX. Uh, in this case, I just took a look at all the times that the, the Houghton site in the, um, you know, the first 36 hours that, that we, you know, were doing the forecast. Um, how often it had MVFR or lower ceilings, and then took a look at where our aviation grids were, were showing in that case. So during the month of February, when we were doing some of our previous calculations, you know, you can see where you'd, you'd essentially want it to be you know, closer to or similar to what the METAR, actual METAR values are. But, you know, here in this case, we were getting, you know, you know 50 the OBS between, you know, like 200 and, and 7,000. Feet and you know with MVFR you, you don't really your ceilings to be coming up that that high. But once we switched over to March, and fortunately in this year with the with the spring being you know kind of a lot cooler and a good majority of our snow fell in February and March and and actually even into April up here. Um, you know so we kind of similar conditions both in February and March and that improvement you know definitely brought the you know the the ceiling the in the our aviation grid down to a, at least a, a little more reasonable values and, you know, a lot less of a high bias than what we had been seeing. So I think that's definitely a, a turn in the right direction and kind of continue to focus on that. Our, our main thing for what we work on in the, in the future is to try and improve that uh, during those IFR and lower ceilings conditions. Um, and then also kind of take a look at some summertime convection. Our verification has just been in these, you know, these last couple of months. So it'd be nice, nice and I'd be interested to see how well it performs um, with convective situations. Uh, so probably plan on doing some sort of verification this summer. Um, and also maybe start to improve some um, influence of our forecast into that, especially if we um, maybe start to create, you know, experimental tasks you know, some of our offices are doing based off of those grids. Um, and also, if we start putting the information on the web, um, that, you know, being able to have that consistency between our forecast and what the, the ceiling and visibility grids are, are showing would be would be good. Um, I think that the expanding the database to the web is going to probably be one of our first things that we end up doing, uh, just based off of some of the feedback that we've gotten from our aviation customers, being able to have that, especially since we only have a, a few and then several, you know, several airports across the area. They seem pretty interested and and open to to using some of that data. So here's an example of of you know some data that like Jackson, Kentucky, and the Boston office in Charleston, West Virginia do both with forecast graphics and then also using the point and click forecast. Uh, so in conclusion, you know the big thing um, in this case is you know the performance of the visibility grids. They you know, just showing a lot of skill and, you know, as good or even a little better than our tasks, um, you know, which is, you know, it's a good confidence builder that you know, that's definitely going in the right direction, especially with the, the you know, potential that we may be doing visibility grids uh, sometime in the near future. Um, ceiling grids definitely show an improvement here over the last couple of months with some of the changes, but they still need to, need to definitely be worked on a little bit more to, to improve those lower end. Values. And overall, I think, you know, definitely a good start. I know I end up using, you know, especially now that I've seen some of the verification, end up using a lot of our uh, experimental group, you know, grids for my TAF preparation you know, process. And, and, you know, definitely be a starting point, especially if you're busy in the real short term. You, you can, you know, I've had pretty decent confidence on being able to use some of it in the longer term. I think that's all I have if anyone has any questions. George, here I have a question. 
Um, 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 visibility, you don't mention the visibility reductions in snow. Did you count those? No, but all, um, all derived out from what the models are showing. Well, what does that mean? Does, that, does the model include visibility reduction in snow? Yep, yep, yep. Okay. And the second question is, uh, uh, you, you suggest that you're doing sealing by relative humidity. Mm -hmm. uh, model does more than that, I would assume. You could use a liquid water threshold or a, or a condensed water threshold uh, from most of these models. How come you didn't use it? It's, it's largely due to our, our limitations on what we get into our, our forecast, our GFE forecast system. Um, that go that is, is a lot more limited than what you know we in AWIPS and what we get from the models. So. So our, my hand kind of tied based off of off of what we get into into that, and um, that's kind of why we we stuck with the with the relative humidity. Can you have an idea of what kind of thresholds you use for relative humidity? Um, uh, we just kind of, especially once we get the respect to ice, uh, just a lot of it kind of had to be tweaked based off a of model, uh, but usually we'll use anywhere from. Um, you know, like somewhere in like the 95 to a, you know 105 percent range for for um, with respect to ice, and, and you know, dependently, I kind of tweaked it based off of like the NAM tends to to go a lot higher in the in the RH with respect to ice than some of the other models. So I kind of had to tweak it based off of off of those those. Values. Unfortunately, it wasn't wholly scientific, but um, it kind of just kind of adjusted it to make it more realistic with what. Um, we kind of see with those GFS. Uh, when I use that, it ends up being a little bit lower because it doesn't um, go tend to go as high as what like the NAM would end up going. And then just the straight RH um, and those values just kind of used anywhere from uh, uh, it's, uh, like eight to to ninety to you know a hundred type range there, and the you know that also adjusted based off of the models you know on on their how at least I had kind of been verifying or what I've been seeing um, for them for up here. So no strict scientific type data there, but I, that's, I think that's the big, the hold up for, for some of the ceiling data is just trying to to maybe come up with a better way or, you know, to be able to use or get some of that model data, but you know, with our with what we get in, in GFE, it really kind of holds us back. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any I, other questions for Steve? Yeah, uh, Brian Moretzky at Eastern Region Headquarters. Hi. Um, quick question. I kind of missed the vacation. What what was the NDFD? What are you using as NDFD? Sorry, our AFD was just our, our aviation grids. Okay, and kind of those used that as instead of tell the aviation grids um, okay. at the time, but that was just our strict grids from from within uh, within GFE. And what what I ended up using was um, the those files that are outputted that are put into the Avian FPS. Um, I have a script that runs that archives those every hour, and then um, we have a here in the office that's really good with um, Fell, so he wrote up a program where I can kind of, you know, select time periods and they'll grab all the METAR and all those um, text files and and grab and create some of that verification for me. So are the OBS like surfed into NDFD? Is that what you're saying? I'm, what what is NDFD? It's the it's your forecast based yep, off it's our model. forecast okay. aviation grid. Okay, so I was that so different than the models if you were using. Oh, okay. It's, it's why so different than the aviation forecast, uh, the TAP forecast. Well, the, the TAP forecast, we're not we're not, not actually using the, the our aviation grids in the TAP forecast. Um, the few of us that kind of you know we'll use that as time, but it's we're using it more as a guidance. So we're really using the the aviation grids to create the TAP. Ends up being different because the tasks are done from what our aviation grids are. Okay, so so then the reverse question: Why are, are why is the aviation grid so much different than the initial models going into them? Um, I, 
more you were kind of looking in, like, with um, with some of those moss guidance and that. Yeah, yeah versus yeah. you compared to the moss and stuff like that. Yeah, and I think that's a, largely due to the, you know, the moss values were just those, you know, the three runs with uh, the aviation grids were pulling in, um, you know, some of the local wharf models, um, the straight, like, more GFS models. Instead of in, in addition to some of the moss guidance, so um, the fact you're kind of pulling all of them in there, um, you know, kind of did some of those differences. And I think that's where, especially in the visibility, being able to pull in some of the straight, like them in our local wharf model visibility data, I think that um, definitely helped out. Um, and the, what we've seen up here with um, some moss data, um, you know, it, it's very iffy on, on lake effect scenarios, and I think that's where, um, you know, being able to pull in the straight model data where they're picking up on those lake effect bands, um, you know, I think that's where the, it really helped out the visibility and showed that improvement. Okay, makes sense. Uh, and so I guess second question kind of related to uh, the previous uh, mm -hmm. question from the, uh, from the person on the phone. Why not? For some of the models, you just get direct. You can directly get some of these fields. Yep. Uh, why not just directly use those fields? Yeah. Um, anywhere where we get the like the ceiling grids, where it's um, well, the mock guidance we you know of course use like the, the you know the predominant height data there. Um, like HRR, yeah. um, we get ceiling data from that, so we use that. So. Um, you know, the, anything where we actually get a straight model data, we'll use that, and then and to fill in the one. So, like the you know, like the num and and the GFS, where we're not getting that that model straight model data, we we derive it out. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. I, I was confused a little there, but that makes All sense. Right, yeah, I probably should have clarified that when I put in the in the model data. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? 